Uh, last time I began the exposition of Russell's uh, theory of uh, descriptions. And a lot of people tell you that this is the most important result in philosophy over the past 100 or 150 years. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, one is that it looked like we at last had a scientific method in philosophy. Uh, philosophy could be as rigorous as mathematics or as any science. Uh, and indeed, uh, thanks to Frege, and as well as uh, Frege, Russell, Peano, Boole, and other people, but mostly Frege, we now had a language in which we could express philosophical problems and philosophical solutions. It was uh, the language of the predicate calculus. And as I've told you, ironically, Frege uh, never used the notation uh, that we now find comfortable, the, the backward Z and the upside down A. Um, uh, Frege never used that notation. He had a different notation, and I've never learned that people who know it say that it's quite elegant, but in fact, it's not used. The, you, the, the notation that's used is this standard uh, notation of the, well, we'd use it if we had a piece of chalk that worked. That one looks like it's pretty good. Um, if you want to say that there is a king of France, you can do it that way. There is some x that k kx, and if you want to say there's only one of those guys, uh, Russell had a neat trick for doing that. And for everything y, if y is a king of France, then y is identical with x. Now, why does that do the job you want it to do? Well, this says there is at least one guy who's king of France, and this says there is at most one guy. How does it say that? It says, take anything else in your universe and look at that, and if it's a king of France too, then it's identical with that guy you originally talked about. And if you want to say that guy is bald, you just add this. Now, I'm no good with brackets, so let me make sure. Yeah, it's all right. I got him. All right, so the universal quantifier here is in the scope of the existential quantifier. Now, that looks like a big deal, and in a way it is, because um, if you go back and read Plato and Aristotle, they didn't have this. Uh, the one thing that contemporary philosophers have, the one tool that we have, uh, which was simply unavailable to philosophers prior to Frege is modern logic. And it, as I've explained to you earlier, it is a vast improvement on Aristotelian logic. It's just much more powerful than the traditional Aristotelian logic. So powerful indeed uh, that as far as I know, even in very backward places, uh, nobody uh, teaches in any logic course uh, just Aristotelian logic. This is the kind of uh, stuff you will learn uh, if you take any logic course in this university or any other major university. Okay, now, it wasn't just that this was an important result, uh, <clears throat> but it uh, gave people the impression, and this impression was encouraged by Wittgenstein, uh, that the philosophy language was a center of philosophy. Uh, that this provided us, uh, provided us with a model for solving philosophical problems, and indeed, um, all philosophical problems ought to be problems in the philosophy of language. And, if we, and indeed, there was even a period in the uh, half a century ago, in the 50s and 60s, uh, when people thought, what we really ought to do is get a logically perfect language, and this was a start on that. And in that language, you wouldn't, the philosophical problems wouldn't even come up. You wouldn't have the problem about the ontological proof because you can't even state it in this uh, vocabulary because uh, the existence is marked by a separate notation from the verb exists in ordinary <clears throat> English or other languages. Uh, so this gave us a, an ideal language, and the ideal language would, uh, would make it impossible uh, to state all the traditional muddled philosophical problems. 
when I was a little kid and I first got interested in philosophy, I was a little scared because I thought, oh my God, if we've got to learn an ideal language, I don't know if I can learn it. I'm having enough trouble with Spanish and French. Uh, but the idea was not that you're going to go into the marketplace and give people uh, sentences in the predicate calculus. Uh, the idea was uh, that you're going to be able to solve <coughs> philosophical problems in a way that previous generations for 2,500 years were unable to solve them because at last you had a notation in which you could do that. Now, it didn't happen uh, in, the, in the sense that we didn't solve all, the civil, all philosophical problems in the philosophy of language. On the other hand, it did make a permanent difference to philosophy. If you want to study uh, the philosophy of language uh, today, uh, you've got to use this kind of stuff, and you have to understand it when other people use it. Uh, so Russell made a permanent change in the history of the subject. All right, so let's go through that sheet. I didn't finish going through it last time, and I want to go through that before we discuss some criticisms of Russell. Now, before I go into it, though, let me ask this question. Uh, why didn't uh, Russell accept Frege's solution? Frege had a solution to all these problems. Uh, and the answer that most textbooks give is because Frege couldn't handle uh, statements like the king of France is bald. Frege had to say uh, that it's neither true nor false. And Russell thought it's obviously false. If there isn't any such a person as the king of France, then it's false that the king of France is bald. Frege thought, no, it, it's neither true nor false because you're presupposing the existence of a guy and then saying apparently about that guy that is bald. But you can't make any such a statement <coughs> if there is no such guy. So it looked like Frege <coughs> had a, a solution to the problem, which gave us something that logicians hate, namely truth value gaps. Statements that look like they're OK in ordinary English. The king of France is bald is certainly meaningful. But it's neither true nor false, and that looks like it's bad news because, according to the law of excluded middle, any well-formed statement, if it's a real statement, uh, then it ought to be either true or false. And Russell could show that it was false. That's what this shows. This shows that the statement the king of France is bald is simply false because here's what it actually says. It says there's one and only one guy who satisfies this condition of being king of France, and that one and only one guy uh, satisfies the condition of being bald, and that's false. There is no such a guy. Now, in fact, I think Frege had a much deeper reason uh, for uh, rejecting, uh, for not accepting the analysis that says it's neither true nor false, and that was his theory of concepts, which is a very deep theory and something we, I ought to tell you more about, though I did try to explain it when we talked about Frege. A concept is the reference of a grammatical predicate, but a concept is also a function. It's a very special type of function because it's a function that always takes a truth value, either the true or the false. But now, if you have a function like x is bald, and that's a function like any other, and you assign an argument to that function, and the argument you assign is uh, referred to by the expression the king of France, then you didn't succeed in assigning an argument, because there is no such guy. So you have a function for which you have not assigned an argument, and consequently, there's no value. The function x is bald has no value for the argument the king of France, because there's no such argument. There's no such guy as the king of France. That's the deep reason that Frege had uh, for saying that uh, the statement was neither true nor false. However, in the literature, this is the, uh, the one that people have come uh, uh, to accept. They thought Russell objected to Frege on the grounds that Frege uh, left truth value gaps, and that Frege left uh, truth value gaps because he thought <coughs> that uh, the, the uh, sentence had a presupposition, the st I'll take questions in a second, that the statement had a presupposition which was false. And in fact, Frege uh, does give an argument. You remember the argument goes, well, it, we can't say that it's false that the king of France is bald. He doesn't use that example, but examples like that. We can't say that it's false that the king of France is bald. <laughs> Uh, because if we did, then the statement that King of France is bald would have two different negations. 
it could be negated by saying the king of France is not bald, which is what Frege thought was the real negation, or it could be negated by saying the king of France does not exist. So the negation of the king of France is bald would be a disjunction. Either the king of France does not exist, or he does exist uh, and is, what did I, not lost here, it's not bald. Um, and that just seemed wrong to Frege. And he does use that argument, but I think the deep argument in Frege, the one that really appealed to him, is the one about, uh, that I just gave you about uh, concepts being uh, of, uh, functions that always take truth values. Let's not forget Frege was a mathematician, and he kind of hated ordinary language. He thought ordinary language was a hopeless mess. Uh, and what we ought to do is get, um, uh, is get a logically perfect language, and this is it. I mean, Frege invented it, but the notation isn't uh, Frege's notation. Uh, people who know more about this than I do tell me there have really been four great logicians in the history of the subject, or maybe four and a half. Uh, and they are Aristotle, uh, Frege, uh, Gödel, and Alfred Tarski. And Alfred used to lecture, I guess, in, probably in this very room. And he is once quoted as saying that we ought to use this language in ordinary speech. Uh, and he said, if I was the President of the United States, I'd make people learn the uh, material conditional instead of using uh, the ordinary English if. You use, instead of if P then Q, you would have this notation. And somebody pointed out to him, Alfred, you just use the word if in the ordinary sense when you said if I were the President of the United States. But in any case, this is a problem. <laughs> about trying to get an ideal language to replace ordinary language. Uh, anyway, we, uh, the, the, uh, there is a much deeper issue here uh, than the one that I've raised so far, and I want to just raise it and then we'll stop for questions. Here is the deeper issue. Russell thought he had a really radical objection to Frege's whole approach to language. Frege's approach to language is to ask how do words refer to things? And his answer is, it's in virtue of the fact that they have a sense, or zin. And, the, and the, in the sentence, the king of France is bald, the expression the king of France has a sense. It has a zin that gives a mode of presentation. And you remember the famous example of the evening star and the morning star. The same object can be presented with different modes of presentation. Now, Russell thought he couldn't make sense of that idea. And in the article, in the classic article on denoting, there's a really mysterious passage about uh, the first line of Gray's elegy. Do you remember that uh, passage? I, it gave me a lot of headaches uh, when I was your age and I first read it. And God, I got so damned exasperated with it, I wrote an article about it. It's the most boring thing I ever wrote in my life. It's got a catchy title. It's called Russell's Objections to Frege's Theory of Sense and Reference. And it uh, occurred in analysis uh, for 1950, God, well, more than half a century ago, 1958. And I'll put it on the web if I can. I, I, I don't think I'm violating anybody's copyright if I, if I put it on vSpace. If you want to know what really bothered uh, uh, Russell about Frege, it was uh, this. But it's, uh, Russell's argument against Frege is a bad argument for reasons I explained. Ru in a nutshell, Russell had a theory of the propositions, and he, a theory of propositions, and he thought if the sense was actually part of the proposition, then on Frege's own account, uh, the sense would always drop right through to the reference, because that's what senses do is they determine <coughs> references. But then if that was true, you wouldn't be able to refer to the sense of an expression. And he gives uh, the sense of the sentence, uh, the first line of Gray's elegy. By the way, whatever else you get out of these guys, you get a picture of their conception of literature. Uh, of a century ago. Remember, uh, we talked about the author of Waverly, and we'll hear more about him in a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, I, I imagine most of you have never read a Gray's Elegy. I, I won't ask for a show of hands. You'd be embarrassed. Well, I, uh, your grandparents uh, loved a wonderful poem uh, called 
uh, uh, by, uh, uh, what's his name, Sir Thomas Gray, I forget his, uh, his, uh, his real name, but Gray, and it was called Elegy in a Country Churchyard, and it begins, curfew tells the knoll of parting day, that's the first line uh, of Gray's Elegy, and it goes on in extremely uh, sentimental terms. I think the final line goes, of all sad words of mouth or pen, the saddest are these it might have been. Um, but in any case, so it's the gushing 19th century BS of a kind that I guess, uh, well I'm not sure, I'm sure we've overcome it. Our, the, uh, the vulgarity and crudity of our age uh, is much worse uh, than the sentimentalism of uh, Victorianism. And incidentally, th there's an odd fact I don't understand, and that is uh, poetry means much less now than it did to my grandparents' generation. <laughs> Uh, my, both my mother and my father, neither of whom were professional intellectuals, could spout acres of poetry from memory. Uh, long Shakespearean passages, but all kinds of other uh, stuff that I didn't actually much like, like uh, uh, Robert Browning, let's say. And I venture to say that's not true of your generation. I doubt very many of you uh, could quote long passages uh, from Shakespeare that you've learned by heart. And I don't even know uh, the names of uh, the contemporary uh, poets uh, that appeal to people. My uh, undergraduate generation memorized big chunks of T.S. Eliot, and I will save you uh, 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 quoting uh, in the Eliot this morning. But there is an odd fact that, sorry? I said I can recite T.S. Eliot. Oh, you can. Well, uh, 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 do you like uh, Let Us Go Then, You and I? Uh, that's the one you were thinking of? Okay, well that's one of my favorites, but there, there are much uh, uh, less good ones, like under the bam, under the boo, under the bamboo tree, and it goes on and on <laughs> in this doggerel verse. But uh, anyway, I'm glad there's somebody here who can do Eliot from memory. Okay, back uh, to the philosophy of language. Russell's objections to Frege were not just about truth value gaps. A uh, truth value gap means you have a statement which has no truth value, but he had a much deeper objection, and the objection was that you couldn't make sense of the distinction between sense and reference, because on Russell's own theory, anything ought to be capable of being referred to, but, uh, according to Russell, uh, you couldn't refer to the sense of an expression, because if you refer to the sense of an expression, then the sense would get into the proposition, but once the sense is into the proposition, the reference keeps right on going. It goes right through to the reference of the original expression. Okay, that's kind of a, 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 a side effect in history. What I want to do now is go through the four puzzles, uh, the four problems that Russell and Frege were addressing, and tell you why Russell thinks his theory solves these problems. But then, if there's time, and I think we will have time for this, I will go on to a more recent objections to Russell's account, particularly the objections by Strawson. Strawson wrote an article in 1950, uh, which, uh, was, which upset the Russellian orthodoxy, which uh, uh, cast doubt on whether or not Russell had really given us an, an account that was adequate to ordinary language. Okay, I saw various hands up earlier, so let's take questions. Yeah. So I understand that this is uh, untrue because the king of France. There, Doesn't is, the king of France. there is no, yeah. But what if we characterize something like Santa Claus? Yeah. It would be true that we understand that Santa Claus is a real person. Yeah. So it's not true that he exists, but if you said Santa Claus is a white beard, that is true. Yeah. He does, yes. but he doesn't exist. That's right. How, do you, how, would you how would we deal with that? Okay, did everybody hear the, the question? The question is, what about fictional characters? Uh, isn't it true that Santa Claus has a white beard? But of course, he can't have a white beard because there is no such a guy. What are we going to say about that? Okay, now later on, I'm going give, to give you a theory of fictional discourse. If you want to cheat and read ahead in, in, the, uh, in Expression and Meaning, that collection of essays by me, there's a... Um, <laughs> an article called The Logical Status of Fictional Discourse. And in that article, I make a distinction between, so to speak, genuine fictional discourse, where the guy is telling a story. Once upon a time, there lived a little girl named Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, and the critic's discussion about the story. So the, in the story, there are no 
uh, true statements. If the guy says uh, Sherlock Holmes lived at 21B Baker Street, then uh, that statement is not true and it's not false because it's not a statement. It's a pretend statement. It is a statement within a work of fiction. However, the critic can then come on and make true statements about the work of fiction. So I can say truly, Sherlock Holmes never got married, uh, but uh, Watson, his, his uh, sidekick, did get married, uh, but unfortunately his wife died, a poor thing. Uh, he died, she died because uh, basically Conan Doyle couldn't figure out what the hell to do with her in the stories, uh, but so he had to get rid of her. <laughs> Uh, okay, now the critic makes a true statement when he says Sherlock Holmes never got married, but Watson did get married. But, sh but Conan Doyle makes no true or false statements because he makes no statements. His statements are pretended statements. Now I'm going to tell you that in some detail. Uh, for reasons that aren't uh, clear to me, I think this is kind of obvious, my theory of fiction, that the that the, the utterances that occur in the work of fiction themselves are not genuine statements. They're pretending, they're play acting. It's like putting on an act on, the, on a stage uh, where the author says things. But you can then make true statements about the work of fiction, such as I just did. There's, and you see that, and, and go and read that. But for reasons I don't understand, this article outrages um, literary people in the professional uh, literary studies. I once gave it as a, uh, a lecture in front of a, a, uh, an audience of uh, pe people who are professors of English and such like. I, and one guy said, well, maybe your theory would work for ordinary works of literature, but not for my specialty, Moby Dick. Uh, and he thought, well, you know, you can't reduce Moby Dick to pretended assertions. Anyway, he thought that was a terrible idea. Uh, but in any case, we will say more about this. I, I also make a distinction between fiction and literature. Uh, uh, basically, literature is a kind of honorific status that we assign to certain works. And uh, nowadays, most of those works we think of as works of fiction. But that wasn't always the case. Uh, I am not sure uh, that the Greeks uh, thought of the Iliad and the Odyssey as works of fiction. I don't think they thought that. I, thought they th that, uh, that, uh, I think they thought this is an actual account of, uh, of the Trojan War and of uh, the events that occurred to Odysseus when he went on his famous trip. I think our notion of fiction is a rather sophisticated notion, and I'm pretty sure not all cultures have it. And I don't think uh, that the ancient Greeks had a notion that was quite like it. Now, they did have a notion of fiction. We know that from Aesop's fables. But I think a lot of things that we take to be works of fiction in Greek literature, they did not think of as fictional. Uh, I, I try to use very simple examples, like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and, but there was a, a famous literary critic who gave a lecture in Berkeley last semester, and he got furious at what he called philosophers whose only knowledge of literature is Sherlock Holmes. And, uh, and then he went on. Uh, uh, he didn't mention any philosophers. Uh, but um, in any case, I, I, I was in the audience. I, I, didn't, uh, I had no doubts who he had in mind. But I, and I even thought of, of writing him a letter, a letter but uh, I didn't. In any case, what's his name? His name is Terry Eagleton. You can look him up. He writes a whole lot of stuff. Maybe he's all right. I don't really know. But this was, I was not impressed by this particular lecture. OK, other question. Anyway, we're going to get to fiction. Uh, and I think, see, <clears throat> a good test case for your theory of language is it can't, can it handle these oddball cases? Can it handle fiction? I, and then, of course, I, can it handle a figurative uses of language, like uh, metaphor? And so I'll give you an account of fiction and metaphor. Though metaphor, I have to tell you, metaphor, to speak metaphorically, is a bitch. Uh, but in any case, <laughs> we'll say more about that later. Uh, OK, other question at this point. Yeah. Uh, what about religious things? Yeah. OK, now here is uh, 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 the question was, what about religious things which are true to some people? Uh, there is an urge, which I think uh, 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 we constantly feel, and that is an urge to relativism, is, is to think, well, maybe God doesn't exist for me, but maybe he exists for you. 
uh, and that's not going to work. Uh, uh, that would make life very easy to think, well, you know, these uh, 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 Islamic terrorists, uh, uh, they're right uh, from their point of view, and what they're wrong from our point of view, so let's just live and let live. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Now, why not? Well, maybe I ought to give a lecture on relativism. I'll tell you an odd thing about, I'll put something else, will you, somebody please remind me to put these on the web. I actually got so irritated with this, I wrote a, called, a short article called A Refutation of Relativism, and maybe I ought to put it on the web. There is one thing that undergraduate generations are always tempted to, and that's relativism. When I first came to this university as a professor, and that was a long time ago, it seemed to me there were three things all of the freshmen believed. Uh, they believed everything is relative. Uh, the second is, uh, it all depends on what you mean by. Uh, <laughs> and the third is, who are you to say? Uh, there's a kind of democratization, and my, my fear is maybe there's been no progress. Uh, I don't teach freshman courses much, but maybe these three slogans uh, are still tattooed on the interior brain uh, of the incoming students. Uh, everything is relative. Uh, it all depends on what you mean by and who are you to say. Okay, now I don't know about who are you to say and it all depends on what you mean by, but relativism is refutable. And there's an odd thing about relativism. It's very hard for people who espouse relativism to maintain it consistently. Uh, that is, a lot of people feel, well, they're, relative, they're relativists about moral values, um, but when they're being uh, raped, robbed, or murdered, uh, they don't generally say, well, okay, I'm opposed to rape, robbery, and murderer, but my rapist, robber, and murderer, he, he has a different view, and his views are just as valid as mine. I don't know anybody who says that, so to speak, in the crunch. Uh, but in any case, uh, okay, uh, let's, this is, uh, today we're still struggling with Russell and Frege, but I think you're right. We ought to talk about relativism, and, and maybe, I don't think it's on the syllabus anywhere, but I'll put that paper, read that paper, it's called Refutation of Relativism. I've had it on my website for a long time. I know it's a long time, because somebody asked me, could they uh, clean it up? It would, had all the Unix formatting, and again, none of you are old enough to remember what Unix was, but, but my, uh, I wrote a lot of stuff with Unix formatting, and they wanted to clean it up and put it in uh, this horrible non-ASCII stuff that is nowadays used. But all right, so we will talk about relativism. Uh, but, but the short answer to your question is, look, God exists or he doesn't. Uh, and it's no use saying, well, maybe he exists for me, but not uh, for you, uh, because, well, so to speak, put yourself in God's shoes. Uh, uh, God is going to say, well, okay, I exist for that guy, but not for that guy. That's not going to work. And that's uh, just the first step in what doesn't work about it. Relativism about ethics is more appealing. Uh, I, I, though, again, I think it, it can't be stated consistently because we do feel that there are different ethical systems, different ethical uh, views about uh, how one ought to behave. And it's very hard to show uh, that one's view is uh, superior to all the others. I, I don't accept ethical relativism, but I think it has a much greater appeal than uh, rel relativism about the real world. I don't think you can make sense of relativism about the real world. And read that piece uh, I wrote. It's only a few pages, and then we'll discuss it in class. Okay, back to Frege and Russell. Any other questions? Well, now I'm going to give you um, a sort of set piece exposition of Russell's, uh, how Russell solves the problems. Uh, and it's on that handout sheet, so I hope you uh, brought it. I didn't bring extra uh, uh, copies. In fact, I may have given all the ones away. Okay, so we had these four problems. Reference failure, negative existentials such as the golden mountain does not exist, identity statements such as Scott is the author of Waverly, and the substitution of identity. Uh, identities. George IV wanted to know whether Scott was the author of Waverly, but he didn't want to know whether or not Scott is Scott. Uh, why can't you make the substitution? Scott, George IV wanted to know whether or not Scott is the author of Waverly, but Scott is the author of Waverly, therefore it seems to follow. George IV wanted to know whether Scott is Scott, but it doesn't follow, it's false. Okay, so here's the solution of the puzzles. Well, we've already talked about the King of France is bald, and that's number one on your sheet. Uh, it comes out as false because it's just not true. It's just plain false. 
that there is a unique X such that X is king of France and X is bald. And the uniqueness is a nice gimmick in, in uh, Russell, the way that that is achieved by saying um, uh, that for everything Y, if Y is the king of France, then Y is identical with X. That gives you only one entity, which, is, uh, can, be both, uh, which can be king of France. Okay, the negative existential statement, you're, uh, uh, and here the mistake came from treating the golden mountain does not exist uh, as if it were like the tallest mountain in California is over 15,000 feet high, as if it were an ordinary subject predicate statement. And here Russell shows, or at least he has a way of saying, that it's not an ordinary predicate, a subject predicate statement, because it has to be stated in the existential form. Uh, there is an X such that, and here that little squiggle in front, that negates the whole thing. That says it's not the case that there is an X such that X is a golden mountain, and for each thing Y, Y is a golden mountain implies Y is identical with X, or if X is a golden mountain, then Y is identical with X. I, and there, I, the, the, the reformulation, that is the, uh, the formalization of it, allows for the possibility there might be a whole lot of golden mountains because, as Russell says, I'm using the strictly so as to imply uniqueness. Uh, the golden mountain would uh, exist, would say there's one and only one thing, which is a, a golden mountain. The golden mountain exists, and the golden mountain does not exist just says it's not the case that there is only one, one and only one thing such that that thing is a golden mountain. Okay, now in the identity statement, notice Russell's solution is radically different from Frege's. Russell gets rid of uh, the referring expression, the definite description altogether, uh, the author of Waverly. Uh, it just comes out in the wash. There is no nothing in the analysis which is, uh, corresponds to the original uh, expression, the uh, author of Waverly, uh, because it's just uh, uh, there an existential quantifier uh, uh, that uh, uh, says there is an object that satisfies a certain condition. So there is an X such that X wrote Waverly, and for each thing Y, Y wrote Waverly implies Y is identical with X, and X is Scott. That's the identity statement. The author of Waverly is Scott. Now it's very important to see that, that what Frege did was keep the original expression, the evening star, uh, the, the king of France, or whatever it is, keep that as a unit, but what Russell says is that just disappears. It's dissolved. There is nothing in this formula which is the equivalent to the king of France. That comes out as an analysis of the whole statement. It just says uh, there is an X that satisfies these conditions. And Russell's slogan, the message he wants to get across to us is Grammatical form is wrong about logical form. Grammatical form misleads us as to logical form. The grammatical form of the statement containing a definite description, such as the king of France is bald, is subject predicate. But the logical form is not subject predicate. The logical form is that of a unique existential statement. It says such and such an entity exists. There exists an entity such that, well, and then we go through it, such that that entity is the king of France uniquely and that entity is bald. Um, and this is a profound distinction between Russell and Frege, and it's, a lot of people think it's Russell's most important contribution, that he taught us to see that the grammatical form of the sentence doesn't tell you the, what the sentence actually means. It doesn't tell you the actual logical form of the sentence. The grammatical form is subject predicate, but the logical form is that of an existential statement. Okay, now we get to the, uh, the, uh, the final uh, puzzle about the, uh, George IV wanted to know whether or not Scott was the author of Waverly. And Russell here 
uh, makes a crucial distinction. And I already, in a brief way, introduced the distinction between the de re and the de dicto. And Russell's here is, is the same. Now, there's some tricky parts to that that I'll come to later. But right now, uh, we can say that, the, that on the Russellian analysis, the de re is what is, is the primary occurrence and the de dicto is the secondary occurrence. And the, uh, the, uh, the, dis and the distinction is this. Let me tell you intuitively what the distinction is, and then we'll see how it works out in the Russellian notation. Intuitively, the distinction is this. A definite description has a primary occurrence if the object that is apparently referred to actually has to exist in order that the statement be true. That's the primary occurrence. But it has a secondary occurrence if it occurs inside the scope of some operator, such as George IV wondered whether, or Sam believes that, some expression like wondered whether, or believes that, or thinks that, or doubts whether, where the reference to the object is not necessary for the statement to be true. I remember I gave you uh, the example of John is looking for the lost city of Atlantis. The expression, the lost city of Atlantis, there has a secondary occurrence because the statement can be true. John is looking for the lost city of Atlantis even if there does not exist such a place as the lost city of Atlantis. So Russell made a crucial distinction, or it's been important for subsequent philosophers, uh, between the primary occurrence, and there it says, uh, just in, uh, this is under number four on the handout, there is an X such that X wrote Waverly, W, W there, short for wrote Waverly. And for each thing, Y, Y wrote Waverly, implies y is identical with x, and George IV wanted to know whether or not x is Scott. Now you'll notice that what we're saying here is there actually is such a guy. That guy wrote Waverly, and about that very guy, George IV wanted to know, is he identical with Scott? That's the primary occurrence of the expression, the author wrote Waverly. Uh, but there is a secondary occurrence where the statement does not commit you to the existence of a single, of a guy who wrote Waverly or a single guy who wrote Waverly, and that comes out as follows. George IV wanted to know whether there is this guy that wrote Waverly uniquely, that is, there is an X such that it wrote Waverly X, and for each thing Y wrote Waverly Y implies Y is identical with X, and X is Scott. There you have George IV wondering whether or not there is an object that satisfies all these conditions. Now I think in ordinary English, the second is a much less plausible interpretation. Uh, George IV took it for granted that somebody wrote Waverly, and he just wanted to know, did Scott write this uh, novel? Uh, but there is, Russell is surely right that there are occurrences of these uh, definite descriptions that occur inside the scope of an operator like George IV wondered whether. Now later on, Quine expressed some doubts about that. He thought if you believe that, then you get not, you get not exactly a contradiction, but you get something very close to a contradiction, and I'll explain that to you in a couple of minutes. Okay, so that in a nutshell is uh, Russell's famous definite description, a theory of definite descriptions. Now, one difficulty is uh, that if you, uh, the way that Russell gets out of the failure of substitutability is there isn't any singular term left. There's no uh, uh, noun phrase left because the whole thing got washed out. As I said, it just dissolves in the in the analysis. So there's nothing less to substitute. But in the primary case, you do want to make the substitution. You can do it, but it's awkward because you have to do it with this apparatus. You have to say, well, there is a single X that satisfies all these conditions. You can't make the substitute. On Russell's account, you can't make the substitution directly. Uh, OK, now I'm going to consider some uh, variations on Russell. 
and I'm going to consider some attacks on Russell. We're going to consider the Strawson attack on Russell, which for a long time used to uh, convince me. Now I have doubts. Uh, let me, I, I'm now telling you about other guys, and that's always hard uh, for me, and I'm not sure I do a good job, but let me tell you one real doubt that I have about the whole damn tradition. I mean, this, uh, this is uh, uh, the center of uh, uh, a philosophy uh, for the past 150 years. If you want to know where the heaviest battles were fought, it's precisely over this kind of stuff. How do you analyze reference, particularly proper names? How do you analyze proper names? Uh, I compare this uh, to Pickett's charge at the Battle of Gettysburg. As you all remember, uh, the Civil War was decided on one afternoon. And on that afternoon, Lee idiotically uh, sent his best troops up against the entrenched Union Army on the hills, uh, a little round top and round top near the town of Gettysburg. And at that moment, the history of the country was settled. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, when Pickett sent his uh, troops up there, they got annihilated, and uh, Pickett himself survived and never forgave Lee uh, for leading him into this disaster. Anyway, if you wanted an analogy in philosophy, uh, if the great fighting has gone on about the theory of reference. How do you deal with proper names? How do you deal with definite descriptions? How do you deal with indexicals? Now, we're going to answer all those. I haven't I told you about proper names and indexicals. Why? Why is that such a big deal? The central question is, how does language relate to reality? And the central point of the relation appears to be, most people think, it's where singular noun phrases hook onto the real world by picking out specific objects. And that's what this fight is about. That's the fight between Frege and Russell and later on Strawson. And I'm a sort of minor player in these battles as well. Uh, now I think that the whole discussion is misconceived in ways that I want to be able to explain to you, but it's this. The discussion so far takes objects for granted. We're supposed to think that we come to reality uh, confronting an inventory of objects. Here they are. There's the Queen of England and there's the King of France. Oops, well, there isn't any such a guy. But anyway, there are all these other objects, like uh, I, 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 the largest uh, I, mountain in, the, in the California and the evening star and the morning star. There's this inventory of objects and the objects are what it's all about. But you don't have to worry about the objects. The objects come for free. You get, first you, you have the objects, then you got language and you run around naming and referring to objects. Now that is a deep mistake, and I want to be able to say exactly why it's a mistake, but here is a start on saying it. In order to identify objects, in order to discriminate this object as opposed to that object, you already have to have a conceptual apparatus of which reference is one part, one expression. Now, I don't want to say language creates objects. It doesn't. My dog Gilbert, my, my famous laboratory of philosophy, he can identify objects. He identifies me as the same guy on different occasions, and he has no definite descriptions, no language at all worth mentioning, even his best barks are not definite uh, descriptions, and they have no internal syntax. Sorry about that, Gilbert. But in any case, this is uh, the problem. So I'm not saying that language, that, uh, uh, that, that language creates objects, because objects can exist uh, for animals that have no language. Remember, I gave you the example of clerk, where you can identify something as an object, even though we don't in ordinary English or in any language known to me identify that as an object. But I do want to say something like the following. The cognitive apparatus which we use to identify objects is the same, which we use to, to distinguish and discriminate objects, which, to, uh, which we use to articulate the concept of an object, is the same cognitive apparatus as the apparatus that we then subsequently use to refer to objects. So we cannot explain that apparatus by, ex by 
presupposing the existence of a huge inventory of objects before we get started, because you can't identify the damned inventory without the apparatus. Okay, now I, I, I can probably think of a more obscure way to make that point, but right now that's pretty damn obscure as it stands. I'm going to come back to this point and try, to, and try and clean it up. But that's my worry about the tradition. See, everybody thinks, well, we got no problem here. The problem is with the expression of the king of France. I got a problem with these X's and Y's. You see, uh, how, how, why are we so complacent in that we assume that we know perfectly well what it is to where it is for a free variable to be bound by a quantifier? I mean, Frege invented that. He taught us how to do that. For a free variable to be bound by a, a quantifier, uh, so that the variable now ranges over a domain of objects. And in one sense, I want to say, that's absolutely right. Uh, object, we are confronted with an inventory of objects. I mean, the kid, when, as the kid grows up, he does not run around creating objects. He's stuck with the objects uh, that he's confronted with. All the same, the apparatus we have for discriminating one object as another, from another, for identifying something as the same object on different occasions, that apparatus is part of the same apparatus as the apparatus we use to refer to objects. And you can't explain what it is to refer to objects without explaining the apparatus of identity and individuation, the apparatus of picking out something as an object, one object, the same object, a different object, uh, because that's part, of the, uh, that's part of the same cognitive apparatus of which reference is another part. Uh, okay, well, I, I, I don't want to give you, I don't want to shortchange you about Russell because Russell made uh, important contributions and now we're going to go on to some criticisms of Russell. In a way, if Russell were here, I think he'd say, you didn't tell him my theory of propositions. And part of the answer, part of the reason for that is because he kept changing his theory of propositions and I can't get it in focus. It keeps jumping around. But, the, but one of the, uh, the uh, important uh, uh, views that he had was that in order to understand anything, you have to understand a proposition. In order to understand the proposition uh, that Barack Obama is President of the United States, in order to understand that assertion, you have to grasp that proposition. But in order to grasp a proposition, you have to be acquainted with all of the elements of the proposition. And the elements of the proposition divide into two kinds, particular objects. Uh, uh, like, dog, uh, like dogs and cats, and then universals uh, like the property of being a dog or the property of being a cat. And then he's got a problem. Well, what about entities that don't uh, exist? And this one of his uh, ways of solving that is to say, you don't have to be acquainted with the king of France in order to understand this. All you've got to do is be acquainted with what it is to be a king uh, and what it is uh, to be uh, a ball. Yes, but somebody would say, and uh, people did say, what about proper names? Now, what about George IV or Waver or Scott? And his answer there was that ordinary proper names like uh, uh, Sir Walter Scott are really disguised forms of definite descriptions. There he's like, uh, Frege and Russell both held the same view, that for every uh, proper name there's some description that you associate with a name and that gives the meaning of the name. So ordinary proper names are going to analyze out according to the theory of descriptions. But then the question is for Russell, well how does language hook on a reality at all if all you've got are these general terms? And Russell said there's a class of logically proper names and those are expressions that always refer. They always succeed in referring. But how can there be such expressions as logically proper names, names that always succeed in referring. And Russell said, well, there can only ones there can be are those that actually refer to the conscious states, to the uh, mental states of the person who's actually using the expression. So when I say this is red, referring to my own sensation, then this is a logically proper name and it refers to a sensation. It refers to an immediate sense datum, as Russell would say. But then you got a problem. It turns out that the vocabulary of uh, logically proper names is going to be very limited if all you can refer to 
is your own experiences. And Russell said in ordinary English there are really only two logically proper names, this and that. Uh, and they're only logically proper names when they refer to your own sensations. He invented a couple of others, that and that, so we wouldn't be restricted to two words to, that function as logically proper names. Now what has happened in recent years is uh, people have come to regard ordinary proper names as like logically proper names. Their function is just to identify an object. They think, uh, nowadays it's widely held, Frege was wrong to suppose. Uh, that the proper name picks out an object because it's got associated with it a sense or a zin. Um, and this has become, uh, there are a whole lot of attacks on the Frege uh, tradition and I will explain those to you later. But this is where uh, Frege and Russell part from the contemporary philosophy is they thought proper names did have a sense and in virtue of that sense referred uh, to their reference. Now they had a problem and that was how come then different people associate different senses. And Frege, you remember, said, well, if people associate different senses with the same name, then there's a sense in which they're not really, in this, not really speaking the same language. If you think, if all you know about Barack Obama is that he's the President of the United States, and all that somebody else knows is that Barack Obama is the former Senator from Illinois, then if that's the only descriptions you can associate, if those are the senses, then, according to Frege, you don't really speak the same language as far as this word is concerned. That's puzzling, though, because normally we don't think of proper names as part of a language at all. Somebody says, do you know any French? Oh, sure I do. Marseille, Lyon, Bordeaux, that's the French I know. Uh, well, I mean, that's, those aren't really, we don't think of those as, in the ordinary sense, part of French. Uh, and in normally, you don't translate proper names from one language to another. There are a couple of oddball cases, like uh, Great Britain is translated as uh, Grand Bretagne or Grosse Bretagne, but that's because there's a general term in the proper name. In general, we don't think of proper names as part of a language, and you don't translate proper names from one language to another. Okay, now I'm gonna leave uh, this part of Russell and we're gonna consider some attacks on Russell and the most famous attack uh, was by Strawson and, uh, and I'm now gonna explain that to you. Questions about Russell before we leave Russell. I want you to understand the primary and secondary distinction. In Russell, it's a matter of scope. It is the scope of the quantifier and the problem I, I I, uh, for Rus Russell and for us is, do you put the verb that names an intentional state, George IV wondered whether, do you put that inside the scope of the quantifier? Can there be an object such that George IV wondered something about that object, or do you have to say whatever George IV wondered about, it has to occur inside the scope of his, you can't have quantifiers uh, jumping across uh, the scope of the, uh, of the uh, intentional verb. You can't have quantifiers that jump across the scope of wondered whether, and Russell does allow for that. Uh, okay, uh, questions about that, because now we'll go on to Strawson. Okay, here goes. Strawson, we're jumping ahead 50 years now uh, to Strawson's uh, famous article on referring, and the uh, he is partly uh, echoing Russell's on denoting because Russell thought denoting was something that words did. And Strassel has a, Strassen has a kind of primitive theory of speech acts. Uh, what he wants to say is we need to distinguish between an expression and then the utterance of an expression, I'll just abbreviate that, of an expression and the use to refer, the use of an expression to refer, and what he thinks is we've got to think of referring as a speech act. He doesn't use that jargon because uh, Austin's works were not widely known at the time. I mean, 
Everybody knew Austin. Uh, they lived in the same town. But Austin's Theory of Speech Acts was not published at that time. He was in, only in his lectures. Uh, I was an undergraduate, so it was okay for me to go to his lectures, and I would then go and tell all these famous philosophers what Austin actually thought, but they couldn't show up at his undergraduate lectures. It would have been a slightly a scandal. I, I would probably have done it, but they didn't. But anyhow, okay. So now, correspondingly, on the other side, I, I, corresponding to each of these, is a sentence, the utterance of a sentence, and the use to make a statement. Now, what Strawson says is that Russell systematically confuses what you can say about one here, the expression on the sentence, with what you can say about three, the use to refer or the use to make a statement. Specifically, according to Strawson, Russell says that if the sentence is true, then, sorry, if the sentence is meaningful, then it has to be either true or false. The meaningfulness of the sentence is enough to guarantee that it's either true or false. But, says Strawson, what we say about meaning, what meaning is ascribed to, is different from what truth and falsity are ascribed to. The sentence, the King of France is bald, is indeed perfectly meaningful. It's a standard sentence of English. But what is true or false is not a sentence. Now this was Strawson's uh, major shift. We should not say that the sentence is true or false. A sentence is a purely syntactical entity, and it has syntactical properties. But sentences can be meaningful, that is to say there's a meaning attaching to the sentence, but it doesn't follow that the sentence is either true nor false. Rather, what can be true or false is the use of the sentence to make a statement. The statement is what is true or false, not the sentence. So Russell's trichotomy of true, false, or meaningless is, is a category mistake because the category of what's true or false is different from the category of what's meaningful or meaningless. Russell saw correctly that the sentence is perfectly meaningful. The, this is the expression that is meaningful, but the, sen the sentence, perfectly meaningful, when it's used to make a statement, will succeed in making only a defective statement. Why? The statement suffers from reference failure. There is no king of France. Therefore, the falsity or truth of the statement doesn't even arise. The statement presupposes something which is false, namely that there exists a king of France. And because the statement makes a false presupposition, the statement is neither true nor false. So it looks like, according to Strawson, that the defective statement can be, the result can be performed, the defective statement can be made using a sentence which is perfectly meaningful, even though the statement made using that sentence is neither true nor false false. So it looks like uh, Strawson has defended Frege, though he has a much more sophisticated theory of speech acts than anything that Frege did. Think of, refer think of referring as something you do with words, like hitting. And when I try to hit a guy, only there's no guy there, I don't make a false statement. I presuppose the existence of a guy, but I, I, I fail to hit him. So similarly, when I try to refer to the king of France, I don't make a false statement, but I presuppose the existence of the king of France when I try to refer to him. Think of reference as having conditions on its successful performance like any other speech act. The only thing here is that reference occurs as part of the contents of the proposition and not some outside condition on the speech act in a way that one has to be, for example, the chairman of the meeting. 
in order to form, perform the speech act of adjourning the meeting. So you have, uh, says Strawson, a simple answer uh, to Russell. Russell thought the sentence must be either true, false, or meaningless. But what can be true or false is quite different from what can be meaningful and meaningless. The sentence is indeed meaningful. It's not a meaningless sentence. But all the same, though it's a perfectly meaningful sentence, when you try to use it to make a statement, the world being the way it is, there being no king of France, you won't succeed in making a statement that can be true or false. Now, I tried to strengthen Strawson's argument by saying apply it to other speech acts. Instead of always taking the case of the statement, the king of France is bald, how about the order, take this book to the king of France? Now, if I tell you, take this book to the Queen of England, that's a perfectly meaningful order. But if I say, take this book to the King of France, what are we going to say? That I made a false statement? That I said uh, there is one and only one King of France? I didn't make a statement at all. I presupposed the existence of the King of France, but I didn't actually make an assertion that the King of France existed. My order, take this book to the King of France, will be defective because there's no way you can avoid it. I, there's no way you can obey it. There's no way you can carry out uh, the order because there is no king of France. But from the fact that the order can't be obeyed, it doesn't follow that I made a false statement. Rather, my order presupposed something that isn't true and the, presupp the failure of the presupposition is sufficient to make it a defective order. Okay, so that is Ru uh, Strawson's objection uh, to Russell, and it was very influential. I, I certainly, I uh, believed it. I, ha I now think that, the whole, that both sides are misunderstanding a whole lot of issues here, but I haven't got to my views yet, I, I want my current views. I just want you to see what's at issue. According to Strawson, Russell correctly saw that the sentence is meaningful, and he correctly saw that meaningful sentences uh, can be used to make statements, but he mistakenly supposed that the same entity, which can be meaningful or meaningless, can be true or false. He assumed that the statement and the sentence are simply identical. Strawson wants to distinguish between the sentence, which is a unit of grammar, a unit of, of, of the syntax of English, and the use of the sentence to make a statement, which is true or false. And though the sentence is meaningful, everybody agrees to that, the statement cannot be true or false because it's defective. It contains a presupposition failure. Okay, questions about that? Everybody understand that. This is the most serious objection that was made uh, to Russell's theory, and it was a kind of bombshell. You see, as I told you earlier, um, Russell's uh, definite descriptions was regarded as uh, n not just an advance in this little area, but as a model for how to do philosophy. Frank Ramsey, uh, the great English uh, philosopher who died very young uh, from the English climate, God knows how any of us survived that climate, but anyway, Frank Ramsey died at the age of 26 from pneumonia. Um, uh, Frank Ramsey characterized Russell's theory of descriptions as that paradigm of philosophy. It's a paradigm of philosophy. It's a model of how philosophy ought to be done. And here was Strawson, then a young philosopher in Oxford, who was saying the whole thing is based on a category mistake. The category of things that can be true or false is different from the category of things that can be meaningful. And I uh, added to that, you can see that what's wrong with Russell if you try to apply it to other kinds of speech acts. The guy who says, uh, take this book uh, uh, to the Queen of England, uh, he has given you an order that it's possible to obey. I mean, you'd have a problem getting past the guards and so on, but, but it's uh, certainly, uh, there's no obstacle, no uh, ontological obstacle to obeying the order. But if I tell you, take this book to the King of France, there's nothing you could do that would count as a bang, the order, because the order contains a presupposition failure. I mean, you have a choice. You can either treat the King of France as having the primary or secondary occurrence, so you can uh, uh, construe it as uh, 
if I say, take this book to the king of France, as saying, I assert there is a unique X such that X is king of France, and I order, take this book to X, uh, that's the, uh, the primary occurrence of the king of France, because that commits me to the existence of the king of France. Or you can give it the secondary occurrence. You can say, I order that, and then follows the whole Rossellian analysis. There's a unique X such that king of France X in each thing Y. Y is uh, king of France only if Y is identical with X. And you take, I order you take this book uh, to X. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I said that wrong. The secondary occurrence would have the whole thing occurring inside the scope of the order. So the whole thing would come out as, I order that you make it the case that there is a unique king of France and that you take this book to, to that unique king of France. But that won't work either, because on that analysis, you would be ordered to bring the king of France into existence. And whatever the order orders, it doesn't order that. So you have to give it a primary occurrence, but then it turns out you make a false statement when you say, I order, I, I order you to take this book to the king of France. Uh, OK, so there we are so far. We got Frege. We have three uh, views on the table, Frege, Russell, and Strawson. And it looks like Strawson has made a, a serious criticism of Russell, because it looks like he has made a distinction that we need to make a distinction between the meaningful sentence as a grammatical entity in a language and the actual use of the sentence to perform speech acts. OK, questions about, uh, about all of that? Everybody understands that. Uh, OK, I'm, I'm before I try to adjudicate this, I want to tell you some puzzles uh, that came out later. Now, uh, one of the features that philosophy has, uh, which is not true in linguistics, is that philosophers will fight over the same damn example for 50 or 100 years. And that is literally the case uh, with the King of France is bald. That is probably the most famous sentence uh, in English language uh, philosophy. And other cultures, it takes some explaining to explain why English speakers care so damn much about this silly sentence. I had to give a lecture in Prague once. I, I, there was a guy who had to translate. Uh, uh, and I said, this is the most important sentence in, in, in English language philosophy for the past 100 years. And then I wrote precisely that on the blackboard. And now uh, it's not easy to explain to an innocent audience why that should be so important. Uh, but the, uh, and, and Russell himself said, at a time when he was in jail uh, for protesting against the uh, 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 First World War, he said, I would go to the death over the English uh, definite article, the, uh, because it is uh, so desperately important. But in any case, this is uh, this important result. I, but it does lead to some other puzzles. And, and, and this a single example, there are other examples that are almost equally famous. And I want to give you another famous example about uh, Ralph and the spies. This is due to Quine. Quine says, if you accept this idea, that there can be de re and de dicto occurrences. Quine calls them a notional, a notional and relational, but relational means de re and notional means de dicto, or primary and secondary occurrences. Then you get something approaching a contradiction, and here's how it goes. Imagine that there is a guy, call him Ralph, and Ralph goes down to the beach, and he meets a nice man at the beach. And Ralph, who's worried about these kind of things, thinks, uh, that man at the beach is not a spy. Uh, and then he goes home, and that night he's hanging around uh, Telegraph Avenue, and he sees a man in a brown hat lurking around the Bank of America. And Ralph thinks about that guy lurking in the brown hat. That man is a spy. Now, unknown to Ralph, the man at the beach, about whom he thinks he's not a spy, and the man in the brown hat, about whom he thinks he's a spy, are one and the same man. Bernard J. Ortcut, the local bank manager of the bank at the corner of the Bank of America at the corner of Telegraph and Durant. Okay, now says Quine, if you allow yourself to think that there are these de re occurrences where the the, the scope of the quantifier reaches inside the verb that names an intentional state. So you say, 
there is this guy that Ralph met down at the beach, and about that very guy, Ralph believes that that guy is a spy. And about then there is this guy whom, uh, I'm sorry, he, the man at the beach he didn't believe was a spy. About the guy at the beach, Ralph believes he's not a spy. And there is this guy in the brown hat, and Ralph believes about the guy in the brown hat that he is a spy. If you allow yourself to they, say those, both of those, then it looks like you're attributing a contradictory belief to Ralph. Because it looks like you're saying there's one and the same guy. And about that one and the same guy, Ralph believes both that he is a spy and that he's not a spy. And that looks odd. That looks as, as if you're attributing a self-contradictory belief to Ralph. But he doesn't have a self-contradictory belief. His belief is perfectly consistent. He believes there is a man in the brown hat, and he's a spy. There is a man I met at the beach, and he's not a spy. And those two propositions are perfectly consistent. But in both of those, the uh, definite descriptions have a secondary occurrence. Uh, uh, that is, uh, you're just saying, Ralph believes that, and then follows the whole thing. There's a guy at the beach who is a, not a spy, and there's a guy in a brown hat who is a spy. So uh, the uh, the occurrence of the definite descriptions in both cases occurs uh, inside the scope of the verb that names the, an intentional state, believes he is a spy or believes he's not a spy. Uh, I don't myself see that this is a serious problem. Uh, I think that uh, once you describe all the facts, uh, then you can just say that Ralph has these beliefs, both of which cannot be true. And you can use uh, the de re occurrence. Uh, you can say, look, uh, there was this guy uh, uh, that Ralph met down at the beach. That guy. Now, about that very guy, Ralph believes that he was not a spy. He's not a spy. And also about that very guy under a different description, this time under the description, the man in the brown hat, Ralph believes that he is a spy. It's just Ralph doesn't know that it's one and the same guy. So I don't see that Quine has a, a genuine worry. But a lot of people thought this was serious. They thought it showed you get a breakdown in logic. You get a breakdown in the, in the uh, application of predicate calculus if you allow yourself to use quantifiers the, the x and there is a y that cross over the scope of the intentional verb. If you say, there is an x such that x is the man in the brown hat, and about that x, and then you have Ralph. Now here comes Ralph. Ralph believes x is a spy. If you have that, then it looks like you're going to, have to, you're going to get a self-contradiction because you're going to attribute a self-contradictory belief to Ralph, and he doesn't have a self-contradictory belief. Quine was worried about that, but I can't see that it's a serious problem. Once you state all the facts, you can say, yes, there was this guy, Ralph. Uh, and Ralph uh, uh, did have a belief. Uh, uh, there was this guy that Ralph met down at the beach. And about that very guy, the man he met at the beach, Ralph believed that he was a spy under one description and that he was not a spy under another description. However. Quine then made a distinction that I think is a big mistake. He thinks, well, there's two kinds of uh, references here. Uh, there is the de re reference and the de dicto reference, the primary and the secondary occurrence. And I think that's not right. And there's a simple argument that it's not right, and that's this. If there were a distinction in two kinds of reference, <laughs> and not just in two ways of reporting it, then it ought to be a distinction that Ralph can make. You see, Quine thinks it follows that there are two kinds of belief. There's the relational belief, where the guy stands in a relation to an object. And there's the notional belief, where the guy stands in a relation to a proposition. The first is a de re belief, and the second is a de dicto belief. And, I'm, and I want to say, no. It's not a distinction in two kinds of belief. It's a distinction in two ways that we have of reporting a belief. And the proof of that is very simple. If there were two kinds of belief, then it ought to be a distinction that Ralph could make. 
But imagine the following conversation. Ralph, Quine says to Ralph, Ralph, about that guy in the brown hat, do you believe he was a spy? Ralph can't say, no, Quine, look, you're asking me if I had a day ray belief about the guy in the brown hat, I, as opposed to a, a day, but I only had a day dicto belief. I didn't, about the guy in the brown hat, it's not the case that I believed he was a spy. Rather, I believed that the guy in the brown hat was a spy. There isn't any difference between those two kinds of belief. From Ralph's point of view, and remember, beliefs only exist from the point of view of the believer, from the point of view of the agent. The agent can't make a distinction between about the guy in the brown hat, I believe he's a spy, and I believe that the guy in the brown hat is a, sky, is a spy. Those are the same belief from the agent's point of view. What's the difference then? Why does one have a, why does one sentence have a commitment that the other one doesn't have? And the answer is because there are two ways of reporting a belief. There's the report where the reporter can commit himself to the existence of the object. That's the de re report where the guy says, there was this guy in a brown hat, and about that guy, Ralph believes he's a spy. And there's the de dicto report where the reporter doesn't commit himself to the existence. He just says, there, Ralph believes that there was a guy in a brown hat uh, and that the guy was a spy. But the fact that we can make a distinction in two different kinds of reports of beliefs does not show that there are two different kinds of beliefs. Uh, okay, so let me, let me summarize where, how far we got today. And again, this is, I, I gotta get through this stuff because this is a, a, a textbook material. I mean, uh, if you were, at, well, I won't mention lesser universities, but if you were at an ordinary university, this is what much, much of a course in the philosophy of language would be about. It would start with Frege and Russell and it would lead you right up to other current disasters whose names I won't even, uh, you'll get to them later. Uh, okay, uh, so we, we have to go through this uh, material and I'll complete it uh, next time.